Sangpola, my name is Thai and I'm entirely thrilled to welcome Am Tandin Wangmo. To list her professional repertoire would take more time than we have, but we will get to them throughout the interview. For now, help me in welcoming Am Tandin Wangmo. Thank you so much la, for being here, for fitting us in your schedule. La. Sungpo Thai and thank you very much for having me here with you. It's <laughs> such a pleasure. Uh, since this is a feature on you, uh, let's start right at the beginning. Where are you from? How many siblings did you have? And what kind of childhood did you have? Like? The question of where I am from is sometimes a bit complicated because yes. it's a meeting of my parents from the west and the east. Yes. But we, uh, our ancestors from my dad's side have been from Timpu forever. Yes. So I guess it's safe to say I'm from Timpu because I live in Timpu now. Yes and uh, I grew up with seven siblings. Wow, a wonderful... big family. Yes, quite Less. a big, interesting family. Less. And I think the kind of childhood we had is the kind of childhood I wish our children nowadays would mm. have. You know, it wasn't the easiest of times. Uh, you know, we had cattle, we had pigs, <laughs> and we had to go to the forest after school to fetch the cattle back home, milk Less. them, make you know, cheese Less. and butter and all Less. those things. And every year when our parents are gone for their yearly Neko Tutoji, then we would mm -hmm. have to fend for ourselves. But all those experiences are what made us what we are today, you know, more resilient, stronger, mm -hmm. and hopefully wise. But yeah. uh, if you look at the kind of childhood that we're giving to our children nowadays, mm -hmm. I think it's not the best. Less, less. So I definitely feel blessed to have the kind of childhood we had. Less. I think I can also claim to be in that uh, free-range kind of parenting like, and I enjoyed every minute of it. <laughs> so where did you do your schooling and uh, what kind of student were you? La? Um, I went to lower KG and upper KG in Tamtong Primary School then. then. Last because my dad was, late dad was in the army. Then uh, later he was transferred to Luntifu, so I went to the Chodin Junior High School then. I studied there till class seven. And I don't think I was the best of students, in, not in the primary classes at least. I remember, like I was telling you, I got a zero in maths once when I was in class two. Yes. But by the time I reached class five, four, five, uh, I was uh, not only coming, doing better, yeah. and not the top, but at least coming second, third mm. in class, mm. and also taking a leadership role in the school uh, yes. as house captain. Then by class five or six, I was the school captain. Class yes. five, six, seven, three years in a row, I was the school captain, I yes. think. Yes. And then I moved to Punaha High School for eight, yes. nine, ten. And I think I did really well when I moved to Punaha High School. Okay. Really well, but not the top of the class, but yes. at least in the top 10, I think I did. And I believe I did really well <laughs> compared yes. to the primary school grades I had. Mm -hmm. And after class 10, you know, I just believe I fell madly in love. And mm -hmm. at that age, when you fall in love, you think, oh, this is it. This is the yes. one true love of your life. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, barely 18 and yes. got married, had children. Wow, la. so she must be really grown up now. La. Yes, she's an adult. La. La. From student, you transitioned to a teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, was that your first job? La? How yes. was it? Yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, when I left uh, high school to marry and have, you know, it's quite stupid of me. I never thought I would be pregnant, I think, <laughs> when I look back at it. Yes. Uh, I, I really wanted to go to college, but yes. then my former husband and mm. uh, we, we were just too much in love and we thought education wasn't the most important thing for me mm. because he was already working then. Mm. So I dropped out of school and he wanted me to join uh, for a teacher training college. Yes. So I, you know, like a dutiful wife, joined <laughs> the teacher training college. Uh -huh. And six or seven months into the training, I yeah. suddenly find out I'm pregnant. Oh, and yeah. I think that was the biggest shock of my life. Yes. Oh, of course, I know women can get pregnant and all that. Yes. I just assumed it would never happen to yes. me, I think. Uh, quite careless and yes, stupid. Yeah. Yes, but I was pregnant and that moment, the kind of embarrassment I felt at myself, mm. I can still feel it. I never wanted to be among you know other young men and women in the teacher training college with a round belly. Yeah. So yes. you know I just went to the principal of the college mm. uh, who was such a gentleman. I owe my entire career to him in a way, yes. Mr. Dojit Sering. Yes. I went to him and I confessed to him and I said I'm pregnant and I can't continue my education yes. here. Oh, but he said that's really normal. You know you can have your child during. He just asked me when are you due and I said it's during July and he said oh that's perfect because that's 
that's when the college will close for summer break. You can have mm -hmm. your child, leave your child with your parents wow, so and come back. And I just said, no, I've got to, you know, go home. I can't face the world. I just wanted yes. to hide somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and he was so kind. He just said, okay, in any case, you know, in at any point of time, if you decide that you want to come back into teaching, mm -hmm. you know, we would love to have you back. And he mm -hmm. gave me a letter saying that I could join anytime I, I wished. Yes either in Paro or Samsi, and that was such a blessing. Yes. I kept, I took the letter and I went straight home to my mm. parents in Thimpu, and mm. I had such wonderful, supportive parents. Yes. So I stayed with them, gave birth to a beautiful daughter. Mm -hmm. And then when you have a daughter, then you realize what the world is all about. Yes. You don't only have to worry about fulfilling your dreams. Mm. You also think of what kind of a life are you going to give to this little kid mm. you brought into the world. Mm. What about her dreams? Who's yes. going to give her wings to fly? And yes. all those things keep you awake, you know, yes. late into the night. Yes. And I remember that uh, after three days of her birth, when I brought her home for the first time, I, I remember promising to this little baby that mm. um, I'll make a great person out of you. I, I had no yes. idea how I was going to do it. Mm. But I remember I made this promise to her and I've never told her this so far. <laughs> because I think, I don't know whether I have achieved that or not. Yeah, yeah. but I, I remember saying that to her and then I thought, oh my God, you know, here I am at home, um, supported by my parents. <laughs> yes. I am a mother and I have nothing to fall back on. Yes. Uh, my husband was somewhere in the south, he yes. was in the army. Yes. Uh, and he was somewhere in the south and I had no idea of how I was going to bring up a child on my own. And that's mm. when I realized uh, I had to do something about my life. Mm. I can't stay at home mm. and depend on my mom to take care of me and my baby both. Mm. Mm. So then, I couldn't imagine going back to Paru College. I don't know, for whatever reason, I couldn't imagine going back to Paru yes. College. So I went to Samsi and I got myself yes. enrolled in the Samsi College of Education. Mm. And two years yes. later, I became a teacher. Yes. My daughter was three years by then, yes. ready to go to school with me. So oh, wow. when I joined teaching, she started her education at three years plus. Yes. After my... Uh, Graduation from Samsi College of Education, I think I was still at that age where, you know, I was very passionate about a lot of things and I always felt I needed to go where I was needed the most. Mm. So then my husband was already in Samsi mm. in the army and they, they had, I have heard of a school in Sipsu, Baljuling, mm. where they had a huge shortage of teachers mm. and so I went to the district education officer mm -hmm. and I volunteered to him and I said I'm willing to go to Belgian primary school to teach there. Yes. So then I found myself 1997, peak summer, July, August in <laughs> Sipsu, oh. very hot, cut off from, you know, other part of the Samsi because mm -hmm. of the rains and the flood, yes. and teaching in a primary school. And by then, how old are you, La? Must have been 21. Wow, and so much already lived. Yeah. Mola, I can't imagine uh, when you were telling me uh, about the silent oath that you made to your daughter. Mm. Because you yourself are a kid then. Yeah. And you had to take on that kind of stress. And you had to... It, it could be a blessing or it could be a curse in your mother yes, and yes. you really used it as a blessing and re really turned your life around. Do you feel like that? La? I think uh, the I have two children, yes. a daughter and a son, and yes. I think both of them in their own ways uh, have been a blessing in my life. Yes. Because every time, you know, when my first, when I had my daughter, I realized something and I went for it. Mm. Then I had my son and then, you know, things uh, mm. changed again because yes. of the sheer amount of responsibility Plus. that came as a mother to Plus. two children. Plus. Is that why you left teaching? Like you, were, you were teaching for about 15 years and then you left teaching. Like why did you decide, what was that decision like that prompted you to leave teaching? Like? Uh, maybe I could say I never left teaching. Uh, <laughs> the teaching profession rather left me. Yes. I was a very passionate uh, teacher. I loved being in the classroom, being with all the young children and mm. Maybe because I trained as a primary school teacher, I loved being in the classroom filled mm. with children, with a lot of noise. Yes. You know? I just loved the energy uh, around mm. these young kids. Mm. And in some schools that I taught, the principals and senior teachers just wouldn't understand why my class was the noisiest, <laughs> you know, and why I don't stick to the curriculum and things yes. like that. I just, you know, mm. believed in the moment. I just did not believe in teaching just the textbook mm. because this particular story, this many points, 
games and all those things. Yes. I never believed in it. Plus. I just believed in you know equipping the children with skills and mm. uh, then letting them learn on their own Plus. things like that. I think which are not very welcome in a system. But unconventional. Yeah. Yeah. So you know all this journey through the journey, like I said, when I had my son, I realized. Uh, I can't be stuck, uh, you know, with mm -hmm. a class 10 education and a primary school education. I thought I needed to do better if I wanted to give a better education to my children. If I was to ensure that my children had the kind of life they wanted, mm -hmm. I had to be empowered myself first. Yes. So then I continued my plus two. Mm -hmm. I did that from Culling High School because then uh, my husband was in Deotang during yes. the 2000 operations. Yes. So he was based in Dewatang, oh, so we moved yes. to Dewatang with him and I begged and begged and begged the Culling School <laughs> administration to allow me to sit for the exams. Yes. Because they had just started this concept of continuing education. Mm. And thankfully those days uh, we didn't have to go and attend the classes. Oh, know. Less, less. I was just at home with my children, mm. with my job, teaching mm. and preparing in the night for my exams. So then wow. I did my plus two there. Less. And, you know, I continued teaching after nice. my plus two. Then I uh, did my degree in teaching, bachelor's in teaching nice. also, again, from some College of Education. Nice. But never giving up teaching. Nice. And eventually, I think, uh, you realize that you can't fight the system for so long. Mm. I was offered to, uh, the role of a principalship in some schools, but mm. uh, I never believed I was born for administration. Yes. Yeah, not for it wasn't for me. I just wanted to be in the classroom, yes. doing the things I wanted to do with the children. Yes. And eventually, you can't fight the system for too long. And mm. when you realize that mm. uh, you can't change something, it's mm. better you change yourself. Mm -hmm. Then I saw this job opening at the Cross National Happiness Center. Mm. Yes. I had to, by then I had completed my master's degree. Yes also and teaching in Jonjiji school wow, and doing yes. a lot of things that I loved doing as a teacher. And mm. We had a great set of uh, teacher colleagues mm. at Jonjiji school mm. during every summer and winter camps. Uh, we would organize, uh, during every summer and winter breaks, we would organize uh, camps for the vulnerable children. Mm. We were having the greatest time of our teaching life. Yes. But at the same time, when the system becomes too much, then mm -hmm. you just exit. So yes. uh, I saw this opportunity at the Cross National Happiness Center. Yes. I applied for it, and yeah. to my surprise, mm -hmm. I got it. Yes, so yes. then I resigned and moved yes. into the CSO world. Yes, yes. Wow. I'm so impressed and empowered by you. Yes. After about 15 years as a teacher, you left it, and then you started adding a whole lot of colorful feathers in your cap. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, you were at the GNH Center mm -hmm. as a deputy executive director. Mm -hmm. And then you were also the spokesperson for PDP uh, Patila at that time. And then you became the um, chief executive officer for Renula. So uh, quite a long list of accomplishment. Which one would you say was the most rewarding? La? Your personal favorite? There's no personal favorite <laughs> as such. I, think. I believe that all these experiences I had were the most wonderful of opportunities I got in life. Yes. And each one was a blessing yes. as a teacher, as a social worker, as a program, uh, you know, designing and training at the Cross National Happiness Center, service mm -hmm. provider at Renew, mm -hmm. and being a part of the PDP. All these, mm -hmm. you know, were a blessing. Mm -hmm. yes. And I'm so grateful for all these opportunities that life has offered, given me. Yes, uh, since this is a show for women, uh, how was it working uh, at Renula? Is there like an incident that you remember still that stands out to you? La? Working at Renew is as fulfilling as mm. it is stressful. Mm. Um, every morning when I walk in the office at Renew, I realize what a blessing it is, what a blessing my life is mm. for two reasons. Mm. Number one, I'm in a position where I can help those mm. who are in need of help. I've been put in a position where I can do things for those who really need it. Mm. And at the same time, my life, I felt, was a blessing then because I realized I've never been in those kind of situations. I've yes. just moved on and tried to empower myself and yes. not take no for an answer when I wanted something. Yes. So every morning I counted my blessings mm. and I, you know, as I walk in my office, I, do, I did my prayers and I told myself I'll do mm. the best. Mm -hmm. you know, of what I can do mm -hmm. in this office today. So I mm -hmm. took it one day at a time yes. <clears throat> because otherwise if you see the things that happen at Renew, it can be very, very stressful mm -hmm. and 
training. Less, yeah, I think emotionally also exhaustive more less. Uh, with your own background and your own lived experience, uh, what would you say is one of the main challenges for women in Bhutanla? Um, people would like to say that we've come a long way in Bhutan. Uh, mm. Now you see so many girls in school, not only in school. If you look at the RCC results recently, yes. you know, the girls yeah. are topping it. Yes, yes. So we like to believe that in Bhutan, you know, women are empowered and uh, we, we are allowed to do whatever we want. There, there's no restrictions. You can go to college, you can go to, mm. you can pursue any field that you want. and. Mm and sit for the exams fair and square and win it if you're capable mm. to do it. But at the same time, I think um, certain things did not change much in Bhutan. Mm. Maybe it's ingrained in our DNA or whatever. Mm. For example, people might look at me as an empowered woman who mm. you know, got educated and has a job that most would like to be in. Mm. But uh, I don't have the luxury that a man might have in my position. For example, I don't go home and just kick off my shoes and get <laughs> in the bed, bed and relax, you yes, know. Yes. I'm, you know, on my way home, I'm already planning the menu for dinner. Plus, yes, As yes. I get home, I, yes. you know, change into comfortable mm. clothes and you know, get my hands <laughs> ready, ready for, for dinner. <laughs> yeah. If there's laundry or whatever, Plus, you know, yes. I don't have the luxury of doing Plus. that. But if I was a man, I would, I think... I'm not generalizing everyone, but mm -hmm. I think in most cases it's still the same. Mm -hmm. As women, our duties are still expected from mm -hmm. us, if you call it our duties, you know, mm -hmm. cooking, washing, mm -hmm. taking care of the elderly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, then if you have children, you have to already plan for your children's back lunch and snacks mm -hmm. tomorrow morning and make sure everybody goes to bed on time, yes. whether the children have done their homework or not. Yes. While generally men yes. would just sit back and enjoy a cup of tea or yes. beer and watch the TVs yes. or watch a game or two and go to sleep, not have to worry about are the children, have the children done their homework or mm. you know, what, what for breakfast and things like that. Yes. Uh, but uh, maybe um, we are hearing stories of, you know, some men who have the moved modern men the yeah, moved to the <laughs> kitchen, right? Yes. right. <laughs> but I think we, there's still a long way to yes. go there. Maybe, you know, mm. I like to believe it's in our DNA, maybe the DNA needs to change. Plus, you're touching on uh, such a core uh, issue for me. La. I have always wondered, la, um, as you were saying, women are usually the primary caregivers at home. And now we are also expected to perform competitively with the other gender at the workforce also. How can we ensure that we also uh, succeed at work? La? Uh, is it even possible we see a way out? La? <laughs> I don't. I don't see a way out. I, Plus. I would just say, give it the best shot you can. Plus. Be it at home or be it at work. Plus. And at home, I don't think we need to take it as a duty. Mm. It is, you know, the kind of uh, sacrifice we have. Uh, not exactly a sacrifice. Also, mm. it is what we should be doing for our own family because we chose to have a family. Mm. It should be what we give back to our parents because mm. they deserve it for all, yes. you know, the things they do for us unconditionally as yes, children. Right. Yes, I believe that, uh, you know, what we do towards our parents is out of pure, unconditional love for them as our yes, parents sir. because we got it from them. Yes, sir. And for a family, if you have mm. one, also if you are mm. cooking or washing, uh, to not look at it as a duty but to mm. do it as, uh, you know, your love for your family. Mm. And hopefully wish that your partner will also do yes. the same. Yes. I'm sure, you know, with all the developments, with all the kind of education that the young people are getting, mm. our young men are also, mm. you know, like, like you mentioned, moving slowly into the kitchen <laughs> yes, and sharing responsibilities. If that happens, then I think success at work is guaranteed. I hope so too. La. Growing up, did you have strong women role models like in your life? Just one, Less. my mom. Less. She's uneducated, Less. also married around 16, 17, I think. By the Less. time she was 18, she had me. Yes. And in all my years of growing up, I saw in her two qualities, mm -hmm. uh, resilience and compassion, which I hope yes. I can inherit. Even, uh, you know, 25% of it, I would be very blessed. Yes. She is, to me, a living example of what a woman should be as a yes. mother yes. and as a spouse. Yes. Uh, I think I owe everything that I've learned in life mm -hmm. to yes. her as my first yes. and a lifelong teacher. So would you say she is your biggest cheerleader? La? Who is your biggest cheerleader? La? My biggest cheerleader, I, I think, would be my daughter. 
I was thinking the second has to be your daughter. <laughs> because uh, I think, uh, because I had her when I was still growing up myself mm. and when I was going for, for my first job, she was joining her school, mm. you know, informally the first year of course because she yeah. was too young but she was still going to school yeah. she had to go to school with me because there was no other choice <laughs> i didn't have a babysitter <laughs> yeah. and my husband was most of the time in the field so she went to school with mm. me yeah. i think she just turned um, three yeah it was in july yeah. she just turned three so she went to school with me and she saw all the you know challenges mm. that i faced in life mm. And there were times, you know, uh, mm. like I said, I continued my education. Mm. So she was doing her mm. plus six when I did my plus two. Yes. So we were studying late into the night together. together. <laughs> and she was doing her class 10 when I was doing my final year exam for bachelor's degree. Wow. So we were again studying together. And then I made a promise to myself quietly again mm. that before she graduates, I must finish my master's degree. Yes, love. And she, I remember she once wrote uh, an essay in class mm. 9 or 10. And mm. she wrote about me as a torchbearer. And she also wrote one phrase which I particularly remember. Mm. She said it was fun growing up with a mother who was also growing up <laughs> and all through the difficulties that I had in life you know mm -hmm. um, including my divorce with her father oh, uh, she was there throughout uh, mm -hmm. telling me you know I understand you mm -hmm. yeah, and whatever decision you make uh, mm -hmm. I'm there with you so I believe that you know if it wasn't for the unconditional support that I got mm -hmm. from my daughter mm -hmm. you know because at that age, uh, you, I would have assumed, or for that matter, any parent would assume that your children would be devastated. Mm. You know, what should I do? Yes. Should I get divorced or not? Mm -hmm. How will that affect my children and all those things? Yes. But uh, she, when I told her my decision that uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to stick it out with your dad any longer, she was like, okay, you know, whatever you decide, uh, I'm there with you. I understand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all through the, the, the separation and all that uh, painful process, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think she practically uh, looked out for herself. She was in class 12 then. Mm -hmm. And it was a very difficult year for me, you know, mm -hmm. to have to ensure that she got her education right and all the guidance she needed because that's a difficult age being mm -hmm. in class 12 and a teenager yes. and to see your mom suffering on her own you know mm -hmm. but she never gave me that kind of a feeling yeah. she was never only a daughter i think she was also my best friend yes. i was just yeah. going to say it has very i think the relationship that you all shared because like she said very rightfully mm -hmm. so uh, being with a mother who was also growing <laughs> i think um, a lot of us uh, when we were growing up uh, we cast our parents in this uh, perfect role model uh, light. There's nothing they can do wrong because yeah. they've already grown up so much. But in your in your case, I think she saw you struggle. She yeah. saw you grow up. So I think the bond is so much more different and stronger also. And what a family of three very strong women in Memola <laughs> than the, you're the right person for our show. <laughs> now, what uh, future plans are for you? I don't uh, exactly plan my life out that yes. way. Uh, Sometimes I just go, most times I just go along with the flow, mm. you know, whatever comes along. You just uh, take those opportunities and see how life turns out. Yes. But if I had my way, I would maybe want to retire early and live mm -hmm. a very quiet life. Yes. Uh, maybe be with my grandchildren then. <laughs> yes, yeah. I didn't plan on asking you this, love, but through the interview, I can see what a strong, uh, what a important role your daughter plays in your life and vice versa, I think. So what do you wish for her future, Allah? What do you want for her future, Allah? I just want her to, you know, be the kind of person she wants to be. Mm. I think like every mother would, mm -hmm. to pursue her dreams. Yes. And no matter what kind of decisions she makes, mm. uh, for her to know that I'll always be there mm. for her like she was there for me. Yes. Uh, finally, uh, what advice and message uh, would you like to give for all the young aspiring girls out there? And I think in your case, not just the young aspiring girls out there, but girls uh, who have perhaps gone through a fair, fair bit of challenge, la, or how to bounce back. La. I really don't know whether this will connect with the young people who are watching this show. I feel that uh, one has to look into yourself every day mm. and learn to accept yourself with mm. all your good and with all the bad in you. Mm. 
to be grateful for the good that you have in you and to accept the faults that you have and forgive yourself for those and every day to try to be the best person you are mm. and fall in love with yourself because mm. I've learned at least in my life that unless you learn to accept and love yourself mm. then it's going to be very difficult. But mm. the moment you accept yourself for who you are and mm. you begin to love yourself, mm. then you realize that your source of happiness is right here mm. in you. Mm. And when you find that, then, like I mentioned, you can try to be the best version of yourself mm. every day. And when you even put in a little bit of effort in trying to be that, then you are able to share the happiness that you find in yourself. Last. Thank you so much, La. I knew it was going to be a really good talk with you, La, <laughs> but I didn't uh, anticipate uh, how insightful and how um, emotional it would be also, La. Thank you so much for being with us, La. Like I was mentioning to you earlier, I don't have a lot of favorites, but at the moment I can say it's uh, the guru drinks bourbon. I'm taking very long walks into the woods alone. Everything about being a woman is my favorite. Me? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> It's very simple to get me happy. The very, very little things in life gives me happiness. I think nosy people. I just can't understand why people believe that they need to know everything about someone. I might come off as a very outspoken, social kind of person, but this is what I have chosen to be because of the kind of jobs I took. But really, I'm a very private, reserved, shy kind of a person. My life, I love my life. Would you rather have a lot of office work or housework? I would prefer office work than housework because as easy as it sounds, cooking, washing, laundry, you know, mopping the floor, whatever, I would rather have 24 hours of office work than few hours of housework. Would you rather be stuck in traffic every morning or miss your breakfast every morning? That's very easy, miss my breakfast every morning because I don't eat breakfast anyway. <laughs> Would you rather lose the ability to read or lose the ability to speak? No to I would not, mm, rather not lose any one of these. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching. Do remember you're strong, you're beautiful and your story needs to be heard. Take care.